Hey, Dr. C with you. Let's get some good clarity on salt. You know, what type is best? What can we get from salt? Do we need to worry about it? Let's make some sense out of all these things. The first one I want to talk about is nutrients from salt. In discussing the concerns about iodine and the idea of using salt with less iodine, the question that comes up, well, what am I going to do to replace all the nutrients? One of the arguments for sea salt or pink Himalayan salt is that they have nutrients in them besides sodium chloride. Um, it's true. Let's get into details on that. So sea salt does provide pretty much every mineral you could think of. Uh, things like potassium, calcium, magnesium. Uh, we also will see iron or zinc, things that we need nutritionally. And some think, well, therefore, we should consume more sea salt because of that. But the question is, but how much of those nutrients do we get? Is there enough to make a big difference? The nutrients that are present in the highest amounts of sea salt, first up is going to be magnesium, soon followed by potassium. Now, sea salt can give some extra magnesium. If you use sea salt in the course of a teaspoon a day, you might get 5 or 10 milligrams of potassium. It's not a lot, it's not none, but it's a pretty meager amount. After magnesium, we think about potassium. And this is probably the second most prevalent nutrient in sea salt. Now, potassium, we need somewhere around 3 to 5,000 milligrams per day, based upon typical adult body size. How much do we get in sea salt? Well, about a milligram. So if we consume three to 5,000 servings of sea salt per day, we can get enough potassium to change our requirements. And after that, it just drops off. You know, once we get down to things like iron, you literally need tens of thousands of servings a day to make a dent on your iron levels. So it's really not a multivitamin. You know, there are things in there, but in amounts that don't really make a lick of difference. You can get so much more of any of these things from a couple bites of spinach, you know, really in much larger amounts. And the flip side of that is what about contaminants? So the way to think about this is salt, uh, sea salt, it's, it's seawater, right? It's purified seawater. And as such, you've got everything that's there, good or bad. You can't really pick or choose. Uh, there's much more aluminum in the average sea salt than there is potassium or iron or zinc. And then we also can see measurable amounts of mercury, cadmium, arsenic, lead. They're, they're all present because everything is there. You know, all the elements in the soil and on the earth are in the sea. So without picking or choosing, you get a little bit of everything. And sadly, not an overwhelming amount of good things. Now, I'm not going to say there's a massive amount of toxins there because there's not, but it's pretty much on par with the amount of most of the nutrients. And if you're going to consume this long term, these amounts can become relevant. So it's worth considering that in that context. And then also about contaminants, also we now have non-nutritive contaminants to think about. A recent study showed that roughly 90% of samples of sea salt and pink Himalayan salt have microplastics, amounts that on a very low-powered microscope you can see. If you've got a, a strong magnifying glass or a low-powered microscope, you can take sea salt and you can just look at it and you'll often see little blue filaments or little colored filaments. Those are microplastics. It's pretty much there and it's pretty much common. So what kind of salt is best? Well, by best, let's think about what salt is doing. You know, it's, it's seasoning our food. It's affecting how things work in the cooking process. It's mostly about taste, right? And so in that context, the taste is almost exclusively a function of sodium and the sodium chloride molecule. Uh, chefs have argued for quite some time that the purer that is, the more you get the salt taste without any bitter or metallic or unwanted corollary parts to it. So uh, iodized salt, for example, iodine is horribly bitter. And even though the, the amounts are small, it's like one part per 10,000 of potassium iodide, better chefs do argue that that's detectable and that you do have a bitter taste to it. There's also high potassium salts and potassium has some bitter elements too. So that's a drawback about even the smaller amounts in sea salt. So for flavor, all the top chefs encourage pure, the purest forms of salt.
Now that's the chemical effects of salt. The physical effects also matter. So the size of the salt particle changes how it will work in the cooking process. And for this reason, many top chefs like the larger diamond shaped crystals. They're not the large flakes, those are actually nice for, for table use, but the diamond crystals for culinary purposes. The way they adhere to food, the way they cause searing to occur, the way they penetrate food molecules. Now, they don't pay me, but diamond brand kosher salt is the one that pretty much all top chefs get behind. So really common form. Um, I love it too, because if you look at the ingredient list, it's salt, it's sodium chloride. And on assays, this doesn't have microplastics. Because it is a purified form, it doesn't have the nutrients that sea salt has, nor does it have the toxins that sea salt has. So if that's the best kind to use, uh, we're not getting the hidden iodine, the added iodine, the various anti-caking agents, preservatives, you know, toxicants, microplastics, and we're getting pure flavor. Then the question is, how much should we get? And there's, there's two big sides to this. There, there's the one world arguing it's dangerous to get too much. And there's a really popular argument in natural medicine saying it's dangerous to get too little. And that people often get small amounts of that. And that there's benefits to going out of your way to consume higher and higher amounts of salt. I want to represent some of the better versions of that argument. So more salt being helpful, a couple of facets to that. One argument is that if there are some compromises to adrenal health. And the truth is that with adrenal insufficiency, the adrenals cannot make hormones that regulate salt. So in the case of Addison's disease, it's common that cortisol and aldosterone are badly underproduced in the body, and the body has less of those than it needs. And that makes it to where sodium is lost excessively. And many of the symptoms and, and correlations and risks have relationship with too little sodium. And in those cases, salt may be a benefit. There's also medical conditions in which the blood pressure is not well regulated. So, so POTS especially, postural orthostatic hypotension syndrome. This is a case to where the blood pressure is too low, especially with postural changes. And many have argued that knowing that there's some connection between sodium intake and blood pressure, that more sodium should help for that. Let's dive deep into the two of those. The first step, so for adrenal insufficiency, no debate. But there is a distinction to be made between adrenal insufficiency and adrenal stress. Now, adrenal insufficiency is pretty rare. That's to where this is a situation to where the adrenals are unable to make what the body wants them to make. Adrenal stress, aka adrenal fatigue, is not rare. It's a real thing, it's totally a real thing, but it's not that the adrenals can't make what the body wants them to make. It's that the body doesn't want them to make as much. So really important distinction. You could have two individuals that both have low cortisol levels. If one has adrenal insufficiency, the body is dysregulated. The body wants cortisol but cannot have it. If one has adrenal stress, the body is in its best state of balance. Now, there's a lot of things that are difficult. There's a lot of stressors on the table, but all things equal, the body says, hey, I'm gonna do better on low cortisol right now. I'm gonna slow things down, let myself rest and heal, and just chill for a little while. So even though cortisol is low in both cases, in one case, it's deliberate, and the body is still maintaining chosen electrolyte balance for that state. There are ways that any good doctor can differentiate those by simply testing the feedback from the brain to the adrenals. But in almost all cases, adrenal stress is way more common than insufficiency. So insufficiency can benefit from extra salt. Adrenal stress, really not so much, no big medical benefit. So then what about postural orthostatic hypotension syndrome? Well, the best way to go about this is to be pragmatic. By the model of how we think this disease works, you could expect that extra salt might work. But when individuals are tested, you know, when they're actually just given extra salt and monitored for symptoms, monitored for health outcomes, it doesn't help. Uh, it turns out that exercise gives way more benefit than salt supplementation does for POTS. So the answers should come from actually seeing what happens to humans, not by saying what do we expect would happen to humans. And then the question is, what about general health? So there's an argument you can make by looking at medical literature 
and looking at a couple of studies showing that those with lower salt intake have higher rates of bad health outcomes. And then also we see that some people who are on extreme diets, like extreme ketogenic or carnivore diets, they feel they may lose too much electrolyte because of their diet being unusual or extremely low in carbohydrate. So there's an argument that you've got to push really hard to raise your salt high in those cases. And it's true, there are a couple of outlying studies showing that lower salt intakes correlate with worse health outcomes, but there's a little nuance we've got to take to this. So it turns out there's different ways you can evaluate the salt intake of a population. You can do questionnaires of intake, you can track their intake by measuring it, or you can measure their urinary excretion of sodium by seeing how much they took in. Now, if you measure urinary excretion and you rely heavily upon that, especially with isolated samples, you can get misleading results because many people have reasons by which they're eliminating unusual amounts of sodium, you know, different amounts on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a couple of studies out there that relied very heavily only on urinary sodium, only on isolated samples and not repeated analysis. If you check an individual repeatedly over a long period of time, you'll get good data. But if you rely upon a small number of samples, you won't. And in those cases, it'll look like people on the lower amount of sodium excretion have worse health outcomes. And that's only an error of misusing that kind of measurement. So once you expand the studies to say, what are the health outcomes based on sodium intake when you track them over longer periods of time, or you track them during multiple instruments like we should, once studies are done like that, the harm from low salt diets, it just vanishes. So there are some who really do push for aggressive electrolyte use, arguing that everyone needs electrolytes, and they always hone in on these couple of studies in isolation. But you've got to look at the sum total of studies. You know, we call this cherry picking in medical literature. You pick out this one study, you've got to look at all of them together. The analogy I thought of is like, like, like batters, you know, batters in baseball. I'm not a huge sports fan, but a batter's success and their career skill is based on their batting average. You know, do they hit like half the time at bat? That'd be really good. Or a third of the time at bat or a tenth of the time at bat? Well, what if batters could choose? Like, let's count this day, but not all these other days. That wouldn't give you a good representation. And that's what happens when someone focuses in on a few studies and ignores the broader body of medical literature. So once we look at the broader body of medical literature, we find that there's not a harm from too little salt intake. And some interesting things, we see this actually even in athletics. They've done some larger studies now looking at cramping, at performance, even among events lasting as long as five or 10 hours. And adding in electrolytes in those cases doesn't improve performance and doesn't consistently reduce cramping. So if, if endurance athletes, even in heat, aren't benefited by adding in electrolytes, the rest of us certainly don't need to worry about that either. And so what about the concerns of excess salt and negative health outcomes? Well, if we look at the sum total of all the data, that's pretty solid. And it's not something that everyone is affected by, but overall, if you're getting well above a teaspoon per day per salt, then it's a huge thing for affecting blood pressure. And even when it doesn't affect blood pressure, it still can affect cardiovascular risk. So even if there's no negative changes to blood pressure, there's still a higher risk for stroke, for kidney damage, for cardiac events, with being a little above typical for the salt intake. And there's good evidence saying that if we could take our intake in America and go down by about half a teaspoon per day, we could save about 90,000 lives per year. And with salt too, a curious thing is that there are taste buds that respond specifically to it. And the more salt we consume, the more salt we eliminate. So many people get in this vicious cycle to where things only taste good if they use more and more salt. And also, they only feel good if they use more and more salt. And it's only, it's like a dog chasing its tail. It's not that this is where their body is, it's that this is what their body has adapted to. If you consume a lot of salt, you eliminate a lot of salt, and you want to consume more salt to compensate for that, so your taste buds make up for that. So if you're someone who feels like you're a salt addict and you don't have adrenal insufficiency, you can get out of that. And the solution is not to be even more aggressive about consuming more salt. The solution is to, you know, lump it for a few days and know that things won't taste great and you might not feel quite as good, but your body will reacclimate and you will do fine on a reasonable, appropriate salt intake. All right, Dr. C with you. Take great care.
we'll talk again really soon.